So I've entitled this Flashpoint uh, Geoprophecy Update, The Hamas Massacre in Israel and the Prophetic Implications. I'm hoping to, uh, in the next few minutes, uh, give you uh, some recap of the events, but then move on beyond that to give you some uh, additional information as it relates to how you should understand the events that you saw take place in the last week or so uh, along the Gaza Strip and within Israel, and how do you see those in a, in a broader context of the Middle East and what is taking place over there geopolitically, and also how that uh, potentially will play into the last days and end time Bible prophecy. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that we're there. I'm not saying that uh, these events are moving us um, in the next uh, week or two months or two years or 20 years. But I do think that we are getting very close to the end of the age. And I do think that the events that we're witnessing are moving us ever closer, uh, rocketing us uh, towards the events of the last days, the emergence of the Antichrist and the return of Jesus Christ. And so it's important that God's people are watching and prepared uh, and sharing these things with a world that is completely lost, uh, that is blind, that doesn't know their right hand from their left, doesn't know up from down, uh, so confused. And uh, we need some clarity. And I'm hoping that I can give you some uh, just briefly this morning. Uh, so Hamas massacre in Israel and the prophetic implications. I'm going to take you into to look at a map. And if you've been watching the news, you're aware of the geography of some of these things. But just to hone in on it a little bit more, um, you can see the land of Israel. Israel is approximately the size of the state of New Jersey. So to give you a frame of reference um, as it relates to land size, about the size of New Jersey. The Gaza Strip, which has been in focus here, where you have this Palestinian area, um, you have multiple cities within, but they all kind of run together. Uh, Gaza is one of the most densely populated uh, areas on Earth. It's about 25 miles in length from north to south, and it borders the area of Israel, and it borders the Sinai Peninsula in Egypt um, to the southwest. And it's about 25 miles in length, about six to nine miles wide, very, very densely populated, uh, a lot of high rises, apartment, apartment blocks and buildings. Um, it is a very difficult area, um, and we'll talk about that in a few moments, for Israel as it uh, looks to move into the area of Gaza um, as a response to what took place uh, just a few days ago. Um, but as we, as we zoom in a little bit further, you can see that along this area, there is a town called Shterot. You've seen it on the news many times. If you've been watching over the last week, essentially it's kind of ground zero for some of the things that have been taking place. It's probably the largest Israeli town in the area, but there are many other settlements, kibbutzim, uh, moshavs, uh, small neighborhood communities that, uh, where Israelis lived along the Gaza Strip area, but Shterot is a little bit larger town. I have been there many times. The first time that I went to Shterot, we were greeted by a, uh, an ambassador from Israel uh, just giving us the realities. Uh, I was going into Shterot with a small team of uh, Servant's Heart uh, members that were with us to do some humanitarian work and to be an encouragement to the people of Shterot because of the ongoing rocket fire that had been coming in and has been coming in for many, many years. Uh, Israel... Uh, gave the entire Gaza Strip back, pulled out thousands of Israelis who were living within that, that territory. Uh, and um, uh, several years ago, Israel pulled all of its Israelis, uh, citizens out of Gaza, essentially gave Gaza over to the Palestinians. And the Palestinians, uh, over a very short period of time, eventually uh, became, um, gave their their land essentially over to the rule of Hamas over them. And um, so Hamas was kind of a governing organization while it's a terrorist organization at the same time uh, in the area of Gaza. But the first time I went into Shterot with the team, the ambassador came to us, uh, got, on the, uh, got on the vehicle where we were, and he said, I just want you to know before we go into the town of Shterot that if you hear sirens, if you hear uh, that there is a, an air raid uh, coming and rockets are coming, you have 15 seconds 
to find a bomb shelter. Now you say, wow, where am I going to find a bomb shelter? Well, Sterot is full of bomb shelters because all of the bus stops double as bomb shelters, large concrete structures that Israel has built to protect the citizenry there. Um, in addition, the playgrounds in Sterot, uh, they have huge tubes, massive concrete tubes that are in the form of like a worm, and then they, they paint it uh, pretty colors for the children, um, but in the middle of their playground, it's actually doubling as a bomb shelter. Um, so that when parents are taking their kids to the park um, and the sirens go off, um, they literally have 15 seconds. Imagine being a mother who has two or three children at the park and the sirens go off and you have 15 seconds to make a decision as to which child you're going to go after to try to pull them into the bomb shelter. Uh, this is the psychological and this, is, this happens all the time and has been for years. And the news media says very, very little about it. And when Israel does respond to when those rockets have come in, it's always Israel is the big, big bad aggressor. That's how they're portrayed in, in the media. When we went to Shterot, uh, we were there. We went to the police station. And um, behind the police station, they have a pile, a massive pile of used rocket shells that had been fired in from the Palestinian areas of Gaza by the thousands stacked up as a memorial, as a reminder to those who live there and who those, those who visit. This is what we contend with on a consistent and regular basis. Massive stacks of fired rockets that have been uh, shelling Shirot for many years. I was told that we were going to be able to meet with the vice mayor of Shirot when we were there and some of the people who uh, are part of the, uh, the city hall staff. And uh, so I was looking forward to getting to meet them with our group. And uh, when we walked out, I got out of our car, I looked around and I didn't see a city hall. And I saw some, something that we walked into. It was a staircase down into the ground. Because in Shterot, City Hall is a bunker underground. So that when there are attacks, and they know they were getting them all the time and have been continuously getting them, that at least the mayor and his staff could function underground with these rockets up above. This is Shterot, and this is the area um, that we visited. We also, while we were there many times that I've been there since, have gone to the border. You can see housing blocks on, in every direction where Jewish people are living, Israelis are living. And out their windows, there's a little bluff all along. And you can just look down, and you can see Gaza City in the distance. Uh, you can see the, uh, the patrol roads right in front. As a matter of fact, if you look on satellite imagery, you'll see out Gaza outline, because it has patrol roads and dirt um, all the way around with fencing, protecting the Israelis from Gaza itself. So that is my experience with Shterot. And, um, it's tragic what we saw taking place this past week. Horrendous. The barbarism uh, of the invasion of the Hamas terrorists, uh, savages that, that moved in into these different, different places, and make no mistake, completely coordinated with, with those uh, in, in little... Um, uh, parachute type of vehicles with little motors moving in all across, fanning out, those breaking through the gates, through the walls, uh, through the, the fencing, uh, bulldozers uh, coordinated all along the entire area of the Gaza Strip into these small communities, literally going in and butchering whoever they found. Families, and you've heard the stories, but it's so important that we recount it because because it's, it's almost beyond our, our comprehension, the, the, the level of depravity um, that was imposed upon these innocent people that were living in these communities. Um, some of them, uh, you've heard, children slaughtered, murdered uh, in horrific ways, babies decapitated, uh, women dragged by their hair through the streets, um, the absolute elderly people being shot point blank and then trying to get away and being shot once again, 10 feet from where they were shot the first time. People being ripped out of cars, women being thrown on the backs of motorcycles, taken back hostage uh, into the tunnels. And that's one of the things that I wanted to mention to you is all along this border, you see kind of plains or fields. 
And uh, occasionally on television, you'll see Israel bombing those fields. And you say, why in the world are they targeting the fields? It's because there are tunnels underneath. And it, there is a labyrinth of tunnels that the terrorists have created through the years. Very, very difficult to get at. And these tunnels, they took probably 100 to 150 hostages from these Israeli communities into these tunnels back underneath, underneath uh, and who knows where in the, in the entire area of Gaza. It is, it is going to be exceedingly difficult to, to rescue the, the hostages that are there um, because of the circumstances and the difficulty. Now, you're seeing a lot of uh, bombardment by Israel. Now, I want you to understand something. And you may have heard some of this in the news media, depending on which outlets you're listening to. But in the majority of international news outlets, you're not going to hear this. I have heard this. I have witnessed it I, through the years in many campaigns that where Israel has been targeted and rockets have come in and then Israel responds. Israel, like no other nation on earth, cares so deeply about the loss of human life that they are willing to give up their strategic advantage against the enemy to save civilians even on the other side. They send in, they drop leaflets. They, they give up their advantage by saying, we're going to target this building because we know that it's a terrorist stronghold. We're going to bomb it. If you live near it or in it, get out. They give the terrorists a huge advantage by telling them where they're going to be targeting next because Israel is so concerned with collateral damage and with hurting innocent people who are not part of Hamas. And I have to tell you, yes, there are innocent people in Gaza. For sure, there are many people there who want nothing to do with Hamas. They want to live their lives. And it is a terrible thing in war that there is collateral damage. But don't misunderstand that there are a lot of people who are not necessarily Hamas militants who are living there who are very sympathetic to Hamas and what Hamas is doing. Even if they're women and children, and I'm going to, to make that point here, it's a difficult one to make, but I'm going to make it here in just a couple of minutes. You must understand when people say, oh, well, we're just going to talk, we're going to negotiate with these people. We're, we're just going to negotiate a, a, a truce and it's all going to be good. And we want a two-state solution. We want to have a, a Palestinian state living next to a Jewish state and everyone will be able to sing Kumbaya and it's all going to be fantastic. Let me clue you in if you're not sure about this. That won't work. And the reason it won't work is because the Palestinians and the Muslims that are living in the area have an ideology that they are taught from the moment that they are a toddler. They are taught this from the beginning. It is an ideology of hate. It is an ideology of hate against Jews. It's an ideology of hate against Jews who live in Israel. And believe me, it's not just Jews that they hate. It is Christians and any non-Muslim because they believe that they are entitled to the entire land of what we today call Israel the ancient historic homeland of the Jewish people. Palestinians and Muslims believe it's all theirs. Now, listen carefully. If you look at a map of the entire Middle East, it is predominantly Muslim in every direction that you want to look. Tiny little Israel with a population of about 7 million people, and they're not all Jewish living in Israel, is in the center of a sea of Islam throughout the whole Middle East. If the Muslim nations of the Middle East cared so much about the poor Palestinians that they talk about for the last however many decades, if they wanted to help them with all of their oil wealth and all of the land that they have, they could have done it a long time ago. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the Islamic world wants the Palestinians where they are because they use them as a, as a propaganda piece against the Jewish state. They don't want a Jewish state, as tiny as it is, anywhere in a sea of Islamic nations. It's like a bone that's caught in their throat and they can't cough it out. They don't want a two-state solution. They want a final solution. They want no Israel, they want all the land. 
Now, I talked about children and I talked about indoctrination. This, this is a, a, an image, this is, there's a video connected to it. I'm not gonna take time to play the video for you. You can watch it on your own. If you really wanna know what leaders within the Islamic world are saying about America and about Israel, go to a website called Memory, M-E-M-R-I, and you're going to see a lot of speeches and commentary and television shows that run throughout the Islamic world with translations in English because the news media doesn't cover it. But if you want to know what they're saying when the news media from America and the West is not covering it, go to a site like this and you'll find out what they're really saying about the little Satan, Israel, and the great Satan, the United States. This is a television show produced for children by Hamas in the Palestinian areas of Gaza. And this character, which obviously is a grown individual, is talking to these children and interviewing them. And, and in this interview and in this discussion created specifically for children, they talk about how the Jews are, are terrible, evil people. They talk about that the Jews are uh, control the Al-Aqsa, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and we'll talk about that briefly. That's in Jerusalem. This character asks one of the little girls, who do you love more, Al-Aqsa or Daddy? And you know what her answer is? Al-Aqsa. And he says, and you love Daddy too, right? To this little boy, he asks, tell me about Jerusalem and tell me about Al-Aqsa, the, the, the Islamic mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Tell me about that. Oh, the Jews are, are digging tunnels underneath of the Temple Mount under the Al-Aqsa mosque in Jerusalem. You know who's digging tunnels? The terrorists are digging tunnels under Israel. The exact opposite of what they're talking, what they're teaching the children. They're telling them that there was a that there was never a King Solomon's temple that resided in Jerusalem, but that the Jews are intent on building a temple there again to children in Gaza in the Palestinian territories. This is what they are indoctrinating them with. Do you know what else they said to the little boy? He said, and jihad, Islamic holy war, is the pinnacle of what we are about as Muslims, the pinnacle. And he said, and if we have to, we will go there as martyrs and rip our shirts off in the conquest of Al-Aqsa. This is the indoctrination that they are teaching their children. So if you wanna know why you saw young men acting as savages coming across into Israel in this past week, murdering everywhere they saw, raping, killing, slaughtering, abusing, putting tires around young people and setting them on fire, which is a slow, painful death. This is pure evil. And this is what Israel is dealing with. You're not gonna have a nice little conversation with these people and think that you're gonna change their minds. This is a spiritual battle, and this is an ideology that they are taught from their religious point of view since they're little kids. So if you want an explanation as to what could cause this type of behavior, this is exactly what it is. Now, I want to take you to Jerusalem. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is the Dome of the Rock, the gold dome structure on the Temple Mount. This is where Israel's temple stood in ancient times, until it was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. This is the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this gray dome structure that's here. But they refer to all of this as Al-Aqsa. So what they're teaching their children is that the Jews are digging tunnels underneath. The Jews are not digging tunnels underneath. What they are doing, the Jewish people have for, for a long period of time, there was a tunnel that ran along the outside of the, one of the retaining walls. Actually, it's over uh, on the western side of this retaining wall that Herod the Great built and was fortified and rebuilt later by the Ottoman Turks. There is a tunnel close to the Wailing or Western Wall. It is on the outside of the retaining wall. 
not underneath of the mosques, not underneath the Dome of the Rock. And this tunnel runs right alongside the wall. And it's incredible to go down there because you can actually see the massive Herodian stones that were quarried to build this retaining wall that held up this Temple Mount platform on which the Temple of Israel stood. That tunnel did not have an exit. So for many, many years, tourists would go into the tunnel, not underneath of the Temple Mount Plaza, alongside, outside the walls, and the, and the Palestinians and the Muslim authorities around the Middle East, they all knew this. The tunnel went the, along the outside of the wall, but there was no exit. So tourists in this very narrow tunnel and people who wanted to see the history would have to turn around at the other end of the tunnel and walk all the way back. So it limited the amount of people that were able to walk through to see the history down below. Israel, I'm guessing maybe 15 or 20 years ago, opened up the end just maybe 50 feet at the end of the tunnel. Again, not underneath of any of these structures, outside of it and opened it up so that now tourists and people who wanted to see all of the archaeology and the history and the Jewishness that is underneath could exit out the other side so more people could go through and see. The Palestinians, the Muslim community were in an uproar and perpetrated this idea and promoted this idea that Jews are digging tunnels under the Temple Mount. Not true. As a matter of fact, it's the Palestinians themselves and the Muslim authorities that are there who were excavating underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock and pulling out the excavations and dumping it on the side of the mountain as trash. Why? Because there is Jewish history embedded in all of that that they're pulling out and dumping as it's like garbage on the side. So this is an ideology, ladies and gentlemen, that they have and it's not going to go away. And it is a spiritual issue. Now, who's responsible for this? Does Hamas have their own resources living in the Gaza Strip? Do they have the ability to do all of these things on their own and to develop weaponry and all those and have the finances to do it? No. They are a proxy. They are a proxy of Iran. Now, the amazing thing is that Iran has many proxies and Iran is a different version of, or holds to a different version of Islam than Hamas and the people in the Palestinian areas of Gaza, what they hold to. Iran holds to Shia Islam. Hamas is Sunni Islam. But you know what? Iran is willing to overlook that little difference. You know why? Because we have a beachhead right on Israel's border that we can try to destroy the Jewish nation, which is Iran's ultimate goal. So they're willing to overlook the little religious differences, a big religious difference, because they have a willing proxy of terrorists that are willing to go into Israel and to diminish or to hurt or to destroy, which is their ultimate goal, the land of Israel. Now, let's take a look at Iran. Iran has developed over the past decade or more what's known as the Shia Crescent, the Shia Crescent. This is an arc of influence that Iran has uh, developed through conquest, through terrorism, through uh, wielding its way in, through buy-offs, pay-offs, uh, weaponry moving into different sections. Um, so the weakness of its neighbors, the weakness of Iraq, the weakness of Syria, the weakness of Lebanon, has given Iran entry to be able to move in to these areas. So Iran sends weapons through Iraq, through Syria, into north, or to southern Lebanon, just across Israel's northern border. And so that is what we are concerned about now, whether there's a second front that is going to open against Israel. We have the one in the south, in Gaza, down here. The question is, is there another one going to be opening to the north? And again, this is another proxy of Iran funded, weaponized, given directions by Iran. And Hezbollah is a Shia organization. So it is the same Islamic ideology as Iran, as Iran holds to. So the question is, are we going to have a second front uh, attacking Israel? And that is the big question. And there is a concern within Israel. There are many concerns. There are different scenarios, and I'm sure that Israel has played them out many, many times. 
as to whether Hezbollah in the north and Iran is waiting until Israel commits hundreds of thousands of soldiers in the south in a ground invasion going into Gaza to root out the, the terrorists, to root out Hamas, to eradicate Hamas. And once they are in and committed, then it's possible that Iran will give the go-ahead for Hezbollah in the north to also attack. And that would put Israel in a very, very difficult position because now they're fighting two different fronts. And it's entirely possible that if that happens, that Syria will also get into the mix. There have been missiles that have been fired from Syria and Lebanon over the last several days. Uh, not a full-on barrage, but there have been uh, missiles coming across the border of northern Israel. That means that there could be essentially three fronts that are taking place, uh, that are attacking Israel um, during these days. So it is a very dire situation. And you should understand that Russia also has proxy tentacles uh, in the area of Syria. And so Russia is keeping a very close eye on what's going on. And Turkey, further over to the west and to the north, also is watching very carefully because Turkey has interests in that whole region as well. And they have their sights set on Jerusalem. So folks, what I want you to understand, when you're hearing about these battles and these wars and the things that are taking place, those are peripheral. Are they significant? Is there horrible, inhumane things taking place? Absolutely, it is, it is horrific, the things that are happening. But that is not the main focus. The focus is Jerusalem. The focus is, and from a biblical perspective, who controls the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, what we were just showing you. That is where all of it is moving. All of these other areas are peripheral. The goal, and this is why Hamas named their attack against Israel the Al-Aqsa Flood. The Al-Aqsa Flood. See, it's, it's not insignificant when they choose these names. The reason that they chose that name was to garner the support of surrounding Islamic nations and terror organizations. What they're saying is, we're not just interested in going into southern Israel. That's not our ultimate goal. We're murdering, we're slaughtering, we're killing the Jews. But that's not our ultimate goal. Our ultimate goal is Al-Aqsa. Our ultimate goal is Jerusalem. And we're going in as a flood you want to be with us? Hey, you terrorist organizations all around, you share the same goal that we have, Jerusalem. Even the president of Turkey, in speeches that he's made in recent years, says we never take our eye off Jerusalem. That's our goal. Now, why are they so interested in Jerusalem? Now, they can say, well, it's because the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third most holy site in all of Islam. That's why we're interested. Really? This is a spiritual conflict at its core. Ladies and gentlemen and those who study the Bible, this issue is about God versus Satan, and it is about God's Son, Jesus Christ, versus Satan's progeny, the Antichrist. There is going to be, in the final analysis, a clash. And the clash will be between the Antichrist who comes on the scene and says, I'm going to rule the world from Jerusalem, versus God himself through Jesus Christ saying, God says, no, 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 no. Yet have I set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You see, the conflict boils down to right versus wrong, God versus Satan, Jesus versus Antichrist. Where is ground zero for the conflict in an ultimate sense? Jerusalem, and more specifically, the Temple Mount. There is going to be some type of a rebuilt temple structure, and animal sacrifices will be reinstated by the Jewish people in that location. And the issue is, are you going to 
bow the knee to the Antichrist who comes into that temple, who causes that sacrifice and oblation to cease by the Jewish people and puts an image of himself up and says, worship me? Or are the Jews and the Christians going to flee from Jerusalem and say, we will not bow to a false Christ. And there's going to be a time of upheaval, the likes of which the Jewish people have never seen before in their history. As bad as what you have seen on television and heard about in the last week, it saddens me to say that's only for openers. When all of these things transpire and when all of this makes its way to Jerusalem, we don't know. But I believe, based on the things that we're seeing, that the chessboard and the pieces on the chessboard are being moved very quickly into place to set the stage for the rise of the Antichrist and for the return of Jesus Christ. You see, I believe what the Bible teaches is that there's going to be a northern coalition of Islamic nations, from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon to Turkey to Azerbaijan and some of the others. And I believe that the Antichrist, from what the Bible teaches, is going to come from the north, the north of Israel, with a coalition of nations under his authority. And I believe that there's going to be a southern coalition, most likely United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, possibly Jordan, maybe Egypt, that also may include Israel. And the reason that this is so significant right now, and the reason why this may have happened at this juncture, is because Israel and Saudi Arabia were about to reach a peace agreement, normalization. I'm not painting Saudi Arabia as a good player, or the crown prince as a good player. But what I will say is that it seems as though that he wants to make peace. Now it's pragmatic with Israel. He needs, he needs Israel's military prowess. He also, as part of the deal, wants weaponry from the United States, and he wants to develop a nuclear program. Why does he want to do that? Because he's worried about his arch enemy, not Israel. The Saudi Arabian crown prince is worried about Iran and Turkey. And so Saudi Arabia for self-preservation purposes, to boost its economy, to, to bring in stronger weapon systems from the United States, and uh, know-how from Israel is looking to normalize relations with Israel. It would be a total game changer in the Middle East. So who has a vested interest in stopping that peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia? Iran. And who would Iran call upon as a proxy to do its bidding to throw off the whole process and raise the ire of all of the surrounding Muslim nations? Hamas. So Iran calls on Hamas, pulls the trigger, go. Go into Israel and wreak havoc on the Israelis. And let's disrupt this, this peace process between Israel and the Saudis. I think that that's largely what's in view, but there is far more, as we alluded to earlier uh, in this discussion. So I hope that that gives you a big picture framework um, of the implications of the conflict. I hope that you're going to be praying for Israel, for the soldiers. Um, there are hundreds of thousands that are massing at the border with tanks ready to go in. Israel has uh, been sending in aerial bombardments of targeted locations, again, trying to watch very carefully to minimize uh, collateral damage and to, to hurt civilians in, in, the, in the area of Gaza. But they are creating a pathway. They are creating a pathway for a ground invasion. And it's going to be very difficult and very dangerous. They're going to have to go door to door to root out the savages, the Hamas terrorists that are embedded and hiding behind their own women and children for protection in hospitals, in schools, in mosques. Terrible, terrible situation. So be praying. And now uh, I'd like to transition just for a minute to what Zion's Hope is doing over in that area. Um, we have ministry staff on the ground 
We have an amazing team. Uh, we have a lot of connections. We know a lot of partner ministries um, that we are working with that are doing an amazing job. And uh, so we have put out an urgent need, a call um, to help uh, the Israelis and everything that is going on over there that we would be able to be salt and light, that we would be uh, a wonderful witness, and that we would be able to help in so many of these uh, needs, needs that the Israelis have. So uh, we have been doing that. Uh, our team is working um, all the way up in the north. Um, we have a contact up there, a partner ministry, a pastor of a congregation, all the way up near the border with Lebanon. And there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of troops um, amassing in Israel right along that border to say to Hezbollah in Lebanon, don't come in, don't come in, we're ready for you. Um, but the pastor up there and the small congregation are doing all they can to help the soldiers that are coming up there with whether it's socks or supplies or food, whatever they can do. I just received a short video yesterday uh, of Israeli soldiers that were thrilled to receive the help uh, that's being sent and ministered to through the pastor and the local congregation up in the very north of Israel. If there is an attack, that pastor and his congregation are literally at ground zero. So I do hope that you'll pray for the Christians that are there. Also down in the south, um, those who are affected outside of uh, Shtarot and those areas of the, the Gaza border. Um, in Israel, many had to flee for their lives, um, children and and parents uh, getting wherever they could into central Israel. And uh, uh, we have contacts down in that area to bring supplies and blankets and food and, and uh, hygiene products and help um, to those people as well. Um, in Jerusalem, our team has been uh, standing in line. I, I wrote in a recent email, five hours, eight hours, standing in line to give blood. Israelis are coming out in droves. I received uh, a, an audio text this morning from one of our workers who is a reservist who has been called to a base outside of Gaza. He is there. He said the soldiers are in good spirits. They're, ex they're, they're positive and they are um, ready to do what they believe needs to be done to eradicate the threat of Hamas uh, in the future. So I think the nation feels differently this time than they have in the past when they've received these rocket attacks. I think they believe that, the, that their government is going to get the job done this time and they are committed to rooting out the terrorists in Gaza, although it's going to be a very, very difficult and dangerous process to do so. Um, so I hope that you will uh, remember our team in prayer. I hope that uh, you'll be praying for other believers. There was a, a young believer, an Israeli soldier from a town just north of Gaza in Ashdod, and uh, he was killed. Um, just a couple days ago, and uh, it was uh, horrendous for the, the church uh, family that's located there. He was well beloved by the, the people in his congregation. And uh, so it is impacting um, Christians, believers over in that area. Wonderful to hear from one of our associates there, driving down there himself to take supplies and, and help as much as he can. The supermarkets, the grocery stores were empty. Uh, he went to the suppliers, to the warehouses and said, I need food, I need supplies because I'm taking it uh, to needy people down there. And I've been in contact with him. He took, uh, his, his children are in the military. Almost every grown child in Israel is either in the military or the reserves. And uh, his daughter came out from one of the bases and he gave her supplies for the other uh, soldiers that are in the base and uh, they were thrilled um, to get those things. It was such an encouragement to them uh, to, to receive those things. So um, also, they're very excited that there are a growing body of believers that are in these military outposts, in these units, young people that are uh, able to share their faith and to be an encouragement in this time of great crisis with other Israelis who are in the military. So I hope that you'll be praying. If you're interested in giving, you can do it through our, our website, zionshope.org, and uh, you'll see a, uh, an image up there on the screen. You can do it that way, or you can call us on our toll-free number, 888-781-9466, 1-888-781-9466. So thank you so much. We've already heard, I know, from many of you in, the, in uh, giving towards uh, this important time of need in Israel, and uh, we're, in, we're uh, thankful for that. And we ask, even if you're not in a financial position to help, that you would pray. Um, we, we believe strongly in the power of prayer, and uh, we hope that you'll be praying for 
um, the believers that are there for Israel as a nation, for the soldiers, for safety, and that collateral damage would be as minimal as possible. Heavenly Father, our hearts are heavy um, and grieved by what we've seen uh, taking place in Israel these uh, last several days. Uh, we're also angered um, by the things that we've seen, the atrocities that, that have been committed. And um, we know that no matter which side people are on, that all people who are unbelievers, who, who have not been redeemed by the, the blood of the Lamb through Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary need salvation. And uh, we pray for any and all who need to hear the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ and what our Savior did for us on the cross of Calvary. But Lord, we, we also know that there is a time uh, for peace and we look for the time of peace when the Prince of Peace comes to the earth to rule and reign and to bring peace upon the earth. But we know that there will not be long and lasting peace in the here and the now. And uh, there is a time for righteous indignation. And Lord, we, uh, we, we ask that you would um, strengthen, protect those who are going in to give them wisdom, um, give them strong reaction, quick reaction time, uh, that they would be able to wipe out the evil, um, but that you would protect those who truly um, are innocent and, and don't want to be involved um, in any way with the terrorism and what is taking place over there. But, but Lord, we ask for protection for the soldiers. We ask for protection for Israel, for the c civilians, for the citizens, um, that your will would be done in all of these things, that you would protect our staff over there and that the gospel would go forth in wonderful ways um, as they seek to minister in the Holy Land. We thank you for this time together, for these dear friends. We ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.